Greetings. I'm joined today by Troy Quinn, who will be conducting the Philharmonic in this Saturday's concert. Troy, welcome to Spartanburg. We are so glad to have you in town and so glad to have you directing the orchestra this week. Thank you, Chris. I'm thrilled to be here. You have a beautiful town. Thank you. Yeah, we, I've come to think so myself Indeed. over the years, I've got to say. So tell me a little bit about yourself. What's your, what's your background? How did you get into music as a sure. kid? What's your story? Well, I'm uh, originally from New Haven, Connecticut, born and raised a New Englander. And um, I went to school back east, and uh, then I studied at Manhattan School of Music in New York City. Mm -hmm. And I uh, went there to do my master's, and then I went out west to USC okay. uh, in California to study conducting. The other USC. The other USC, USC right. right. The wrong one. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, um, and do my doctorate there, and got into the film and television and studio industry, and uh, became a conductor, but it really all first started for me at 12 years old. Uh -huh. When I went to the Hollywood Bowl back then, my parents would take my brother and I on vacation. You could have open dress rehearsals then. And I saw a guy by the name of John Williams conducting mm. up there. And he just went dun da dun 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 da dun. And I knew that, I thought that was the coolest job on earth, the visceral force of the orchestra. I didn't know anything, I didn't know how to read music, but I thought I wanted to do that. So that was sort of my journey at, at the beginning to where I wanted to be. That's interesting. So you began your interest in music with the knowledge of, I want to be a conductor. Mm. That's pretty unusual, isn't yeah, it? I it feel is, like I don't absolutely. talk with many people who, who know from the, 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 the outset that they want to be conductors. Yeah, and it, I didn't really, I wasn't cognitive of what it required to be a conductor. You know, I had been a singer in school, I played piano and I learned by rote, but I came to music later in terms of formal training. So, but I knew I wanted to lead and I knew I wanted to be um, making music with other people. So I think that, that was what drew me. And then I learned the mechanics and the technical process of actually reading music, studying a score. And so I kind of knew that I wanted to be that profession, but I didn't know what went into it until later in my school. Huh. Yeah. So you're starting off in high school and singing in choirs Correct. and things like that. Yeah. yeah. And you're singing, but you're also probably making mental notes of like, okay, I'm going to do it like that someday. I'm, exactly. I'm not going to do it like that someday. <laughs> I know what yeah. to do and what not to do. Uh -huh. You know, and I had great fortune of performing with many, many wonderful, famous mentors and conductors. And, and I was singing for the most part in some of these um, choral ensembles. Um, but then I got into conducting after that because I thought, uh, you know, I, I really wanted to see what it's like to have choral and orchestral, you know. And I had a bit of an orchestra background in terms of piano. And then I just started studying the instruments and taking classes and going into Manhattan School of Music and going to these great, you know, masters, Glenn Dictoro, former concert master, mm -hmm. going into his lessons and learning everything about bowing and everything about the violin. Mm -hmm. And that was the greatest hands-on training for me. Yeah. And so, as an undergrad, then, were you exposed to, obviously you were studying music as an undergrad. Right. Uh, were you taking kind of methods and materials classes so that you were introduced to, here's the basics of how you blow a French horn and Absolutely. stuff? Absolutely. Or did that come later? That no, was that undergrad? was all an undergrad okay, at Providence right. College. So you had those kind of chops, I and then you bases. entered into a master's program in conducting. I did, yeah. And actually, while I was at Providence College in my undergrad, I, I, did a, I was a vocal major, but I, I doubled in conducting. and. So I, I would uh, probably the only person that conducted Handel's Messiah and then turned around and sang Comfort Ye in Every Valley, the tenor solo. So I did both of them, which was uh, very, very interesting, but gave me great experience from both sides of the podium. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Uh, and I expect that having been an ensemble member and a soloist, as well as a conductor, you kind of come to understand some of the emotional dynamics that go into being an ensemble member, being a soloist, Absolutely. and being a conductor. Yeah, and there's this real symbiotic relationship between all of these folks, and, and certainly having been in each one of those positions, it gives me a better idea of, you know, when I'm up there on the podium working with a soloist, whether it be a vocalist or Fabiola Kim's coming into play, Alark Ascending this week mm -hmm. on violin. Uh, as her name insinuates, she's a fabulous violinist. Mm -hmm. and. Um, she is just uh, incredible to work with. But that sort of training at the early stage gave me comfort in, in terms of working with, with guest artists uh -huh. all my career, yeah. Okay. And so you're out in L.A. then as getting your doctorate. Right. Uh, and, of course, you know, you've got a great orchestra in L.A. You've yeah. got other great music scenes, the L.A. Yeah. Chamber Orchestra and stuff. But you've right. also got all of those movie studios yeah. Yeah. doing their thing. That, well, USC was a gateway for me in terms of opening the door to that world, you know. 
I, I had grown up listening to popular music of the day, you know, everything from Michael Jackson in the 90s to popular music of the 60s, Frank Sinatra, Barb Streisand, um, and so film scores, Ennio Morricone, you know, that was always going on in my house. My parents were music aficionados, not trained musicians, but loved music. So mm -hmm. all of that kind of conglomeration of musical tastes came to a head in L.A., and you know, while I was at USC, I had these opportunities and after to start in the studio world, doing backup vocals and, and some conducting as well, um, and, and working with these great celebrity people and uh, some great artists along the way, but, but mostly fun, you know, um, and, and, and making a career doing things that aren't so traditional, you know, uh -huh. like not playing Walton or Beethoven, you know, which is, which I love, but I also love, you know, doing TV commercials or singing on a film or playing for a film or, 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 or a television show. You know, those are all viable, I think, uh, uh, viable paths of, of music making. Yeah. Yeah. So, any uh, familiar titles that we might recognize that if we listen real hard on the DVD, we can oh, hear Troy boy, joining yeah. in at second panel? <laughs> yeah, you gotta, you gotta pause real quick. <laughs> uh, no, I had the good fortune of being on Glee for a few uh, episodes when oh, that yeah. was big uh, with Leah Michelle and um, doing a lot of background work with them, background vocals and on camera work. So um, I have a lot of stories there, but I signed a lot of non disclosure agreements. So I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll leave it at there. But it was a, a fantastic experience. You know, just working on, on television and movies is a different sort of animal because most of the time you're in the studio. You know, I've done The Tonight Show when Jay Leno was doing it, um, The Voice on NBC. And again, most of this is background vocals. But I've recorded on movies too, like The Call of the Wild. Uh, with John Powell, we're doing a John Powell piece, mm -hmm. of course, um, How to Train Your Dragon. I had the pleasure of performing that with him at the Hollywood Bowl. Um, but usually we're in a static setting where it has to be this way. And it's great. I mean, highest caliber music making, highest caliber musicians, happy to be in the room. But there's something about the live visceral performance that can't be replaced, which is why a lot of studio musicians like myself offset their careers with doing live music because that's that's our drug. There's no replacement for that. So speaking of, uh, of film music and some of that work, yes. uh, and speaking of John Powell in particular, we're going to get to hear some of that this Saturday. We right? are, yeah. Mm -hmm. We have the why great... You, yeah, why don't you tell us about some yes, of the pieces? Yes, I will. We have the great How to Train Your Dragon from the 2010 film. Um, this is a great score, Chris. This is sort of a, what I'll call Celtic fusion, sort of Scottish, Scandinavian. Uh, it's about uh, it's an animated film about mm -hmm. dragons and and Vikings and their coexistence. Um, but John Powell wrote it and won. Uh, excuse me, was nominated for an Academy Award. Didn't win. He lost to The Social Network, which I can't even remember who did the music for The Social Network. I thought he should have because it's one of his best scores. But this score is amazing because it has a Celtic feel. But he wrote so many um, so so many themes for this music. Now we have a condensed score, but the original has like eight horns and 30 percussion mm -hmm. instruments, glass marimbas, Yulian pipes, the Irish bagpipes, all these sort of ethnic instruments. But you'll get a feel for that um, in, in the concert this week, and we're going to play the five-minute suite. And we're also playing another piece by an earlier composer, William Walton, the Henry mm -hmm. V suite which, as you said before, has nothing to do with the program. <laughs> <laughs> See, yeah, I had actually made a point of asking before we started here. So it's like, okay, so Troy, tell me the connection here so that I can make sure to lead you into it. And so it turns out, you know. Well, of course, based on historical fact, but there's part fiction mm -hmm. in this, um, based on, on Shakespeare's play. Um, and, and Walton wrote this in 1944. It's a great suite. It's about 15, 16 minutes. And Walton wrote... 14 film scores. So he was a guy that wrote film and classical, just like Korn Gold, so many of these talented composers from Europe that, that later emigrated to America, though Walton stayed mostly in Europe and, uh, and wrote these for basically propaganda films during World War II. Mm -hmm. He was hired and paid to do that. And this is his probably, I think, most iconic work, directed and starred by Sir Laurence Olivier. And it's a, it's a five movement work and uh, it's just, uh, first of all, it's, it's poignant and sweet, 
uh, when you know, the two uh, middle movements have strings only. And then it's visceral and energetic and bombastic with, these, uh, with the Battle of Agincourt, which is, of course, uh, during the Hundred Years' War. So that finale comes to a climactic sort of battle scene. And uh, it's actually the first piece I ever conducted professionally. Oh, that's fine. Back in Rhode Island, yeah. Uh -huh. And um, uh, I've loved it ever since. And it's not done too much. Of course, Belshazzar's Feast, his first symphony, and his viola concerto keep him pretty busy in the standard rep. But I think this is a gem. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be doing that on the concert as well. Nice. And there's a lot of other things on this program, too. I mean, the musicians have thick folders this week. <laughs> they there's do. A, we're giving yeah, them a workout. Yeah, there's a lot of pages, a lot of notes for them. So uh, so tell us about some of the other pieces that are on this program. Yep. And I love I it. I got a hunch that most of our viewers will be able to detect the connecting thread that links most of these pieces, That's except correct. Henry V. That's right, exactly. Right. Yeah. Well, we've got a bit of fantasy, and uh, obviously Firebird will be here. But first, we will be performing the overture from... Uh, Dvorak's Carnival Overture. And this is sort of a triptych part of three that he wrote about love, nature, and life. This one has to do with life. And it's a great work, 10 minutes. Um, there's actually a very little concertmaster solo. And of course, Dvorak loved the English horn. There's an English horn solo mm -hmm. in here as well in the middle. Um, and then we're going to How to Train Your Dragon, followed by the Henry V film score. And then just as a little sort of ending of the first half, we're going to play Bizet's uh, Ferrandol from his La Lucienne Suite number two. Mm -hmm. And um, again, based on a French melody and a French Christmas carol, really just energetic. And a lot of notes, very fast for the orchestra to play, fiendishly kind of difficult, especially for the flute players. Um, but uh, I think it's a great way to end the first act. And then we come back and we've got Fabiola Kim playing The Lark Ascending by Vaughn Williams. One of my favorite pieces. Mm -hmm. I've actually performed it with Fabiola. This is now the fourth time. I've only performed this piece with her because I just think she encapsulates it so beautifully. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, uh, Vaughn Williams wrote it in 1914, put it away until 1919, um, and then it was performed first in 1920 um, by the violinist, I believe, Marie Hall was her name. Um, but it's it's a showpiece, but it's not flashy. Right. Emulating, uh, you know, the, the beautiful lark in the countryside that Vaughn Williams is so familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, it's gorgeous. It begins with sort of a cadenza, it ends with a cadenza, and um, just for woodwinds and strings, and it's uh, one of my favorite pieces. So Fabiola plays it gorgeously, you'll be entranced by her. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to another piece, sweet, written in 1919, Firebird by Stravinsky. And of course, 1910, he wrote it uh, for the Ballet Russe, but he then sort of chopped it up and made a condensed version. And that's what we'll be playing, the 20-minute suite. Mm -hmm. And this is probably the most well-known work. People, listeners will know it from Fantasia and, and other things, um, especially the finale. But to me, it just depicts not only you know the Firebird uh, and fantastical theme we have going, but it just depicts great orchestral writing. You know, Stravinsky studied with Rimsky-Korsakov, and, and, and his, his writing of the orchestral and treatment of orchestral instruments is so thrilling. And it's a real challenge for the orchestra, yeah. too, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, Stravinsky asks the orchestra to do a lot of different techniques. And it ends with the greatest, probably, finale in all of music, or at least up there in the top five. So. Yeah. We're going to get a lot of good moment music. when the solo horn comes in. Folks. Absolutely. Wait for, Wait for the horn. Absolutely. Wait for the horn. And there's a beautiful bassoon mm -hmm. solo, too, as you know, in the Bursus lullaby. Um, but I'm so thrilled to be here with the Spartanburg Philharmonic and, and uh, give this concert to you because it's some of my favorite music. Yeah. So let's dig into, uh, into a little bit of this music in greater detail. And by the way, folks, some of these tunes you don't know that you know them, but you know them. Once right. that Ferrandol starts up, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, I know yeah, this one. Yeah, I've heard that. Uh, yeah. And <laughs> The Lark Ascending is another one that right. is, uh, most people can't hum the tunes, right. but once it gets into it, it will feel very familiar. Absolutely. And I know BBC Classic Music yeah, is the music magazine in Britain, and they do an annual, or every, every few years, they do a poll of uh, the most popular music among listeners, uh, and Lark Ascending oh, consistently comes in to that top handful there. And there's a good reason why, I think, too, Chris. It's, um, it, it resonates with listeners, and it's, it's sort of timeless. It's also really an optimistic view of the world and nature and beauty, and, and, and Von Williams had that sort of hearkening 
back to a time he remembered in his uh, upbringing. Of course, he served in the war, saw a lot of atrocities himself, um, but always had this idea of purity and, and love. But, but he, he has a poem by the Victorian author George Meredith there at the beginning of the piece. It's actually mm -hmm. in the score yeah. about the lark, and so that's sort of the inspiration behind it. But I find that this piece actually is not an all violinist repertoire. You know, when I was first starting to do this, study this piece, I, I asked a lot of what famous violinists to play. It wasn't in the repertoire because it's not like, you know, Corn Gold or Sibelius. It's, it's, it's not what I would say every violinist learns um, when you're studying, but it is a gem of a piece. Yeah. And if you can find the right person, I think, to embody that, it's a beautiful finesse show piece. But the violin plays so high, like a bird chirping. It sounds exactly like that. And uh, the intonation has to be great. And uh, again, as I say, Fabiola basically, I think, owns this piece now. So I'm really excited for everybody to hear her and me perform it. Yeah, and it's one of those pieces that is challenging in such a way that often as an audience member, you're not aware of just how hard it is. Yes, And in true. fact, <laughs> you know, the better the fiddle player is, the less the audience notices the technique that goes into Correct. placing all of those you know those pitches so perfectly where they need to be and in keeping the tone production as even and spun out as it needs to be as they're changing the bows and doing all of that really difficult finesse work absolutely yeah it has to be imperceptible and, and yeah. nobody's better at it than Fabiola in my opinion so mm -hmm. um, and it's it's just a beautiful piece to listen to you know um, it, it, it relaxes me, <laughs> even when I'm up there on the podium. Uh, but there is, quite, as, you, as you referenced, there is quite a dance going on between the soloist, myself, and the orchestra because um, it's basically a dialogue between the lark, the violin solo, and, and nature mm -hmm. and the ocean. And that's what the, the orchestra represents and the, the shores of England and the countryside. And there's this talking and conversation between both of them and so um, it's it's so glorious when they come together in the climax of the piece you just feel uh, I think as close to heaven as you can you know mm -hmm. in my opinion yeah And Firebird is another one of these pieces that there are going to be many moments where the audience recognizes, oh yeah, this is familiar, this is very familiar, I've heard this part before. Well, this part was weird, I didn't know this was in here. You know, right, because yeah. There's definitely moments of, of eeriness and strangeness that Absolutely. Stravinsky has uh, concocted there. Very, and it's, it's cross-generational, because I was recently speaking to some school students playing some of that, uh, we were listening to you know, the finale, and, and somebody raised their hand and said, I recognize that from that car commercial. <laughs> yeah. That was also in Fantasia, and it's been around for a long time, but yeah, these are recognizable tunes. Again, Stravinsky had such a gift, not only with melody, but with, um, with the orchestration. I mean, you know, I find it so ironic. He, he said, I, I never understood a bar, life, a bar of music in my life, but I sure did feel it. Now, Stravinsky, for Stravinsky to say that is kind of amazing, but you can see the, you can, I mean, hear and feel the emotion that he puts into it. Certainly, he knew what he was doing. Um, but he, 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 he depicts all of these different scenes, you know, with King Kachai in the garden and the firebird coming to, to life and breaking the spell of, of the princess. And he depicts that with different individual um, instruments so clearly. You know, and also it's a challenge to conduct, actually. Mm -hmm. I mean, because it's so one on one based, and it, you know, it's one of the famous excerpts that starts off in 12 8, so we're actually conducting mm -hmm. 12, you know, eighth note bars. And um, there's, a, there's a lot of moments. The harp and, and piano have these flourishes, and of course, there's all sorts of stylistic bowings in the violins and the strings. Um, but I, I, I think the climactic build up to the finale is just. The most rewarding, I think, 20 minutes you can you can listen to, in my opinion, um, and uh, it's one of my favorite pieces, and, and I know the orchestra will deliver a, a great performance. And it's a tricky, tricky, tricky set of parts for that orchestra. So talk a little bit about the rehearsal process when you're working your way through some sure. of the more complex 
gnarly bits of there where the orchestra is written with these very complex rhythms and everybody has to fit together like this right. perfect little machine. Absolutely. When you're working something like that, like the variation of the Firebird, for instance, how do you do that as a conductor? <laughs> yeah, you, you start and hope you end together and stop. <laughs> um, to be honest, and a lot of this is from my studio background too, I, I'm, I'm very much go to the most difficult place first and get that done. And time is of the essence because we only have a limited amount of time. We'll have three rehearsals this week and, and that'll be it. So not a lot of time to fit in the 80 minutes of music, um, but I, I start with the hardest things first. And if we can fit that in and get a sense of the pulse and rhythm. You know, Robert Shaw always used to say, what's the hierarchy of things? And, and, and rhythm was actually number one for him rather than pitch. Of course, mm -hmm. you need the right notes. Yeah. But, but Which is should... especially interesting because he was a choral conductor. He was, right, primarily. exactly. You know, and it's right. not like, you know, I, as a flutist, I go to play an E-flat. I put my fingers in a certain place, and it's going to be an E-flat. E right, yeah. might not be a good E-flat, but it's going to be an E-flat. Right. Whereas when you're dealing with singers, anything could happen. Very when you true. Open your mouths. And it's fascinating that to hear that he was most focused on rhythm Pulse. even before yeah. he was concerned with pitch. And I think that's actually true no matter what piece you do. It's got whatever you want to call it. If you're in the jazz world, you call it a groove. If you're in the classical world, front edge, back edge, whatever. Um, and I think there is a pulse to all of these pieces and there's something to unlock. Not just the idea of it musically, but, but technically, rhythmically. And so that's where, especially with Stravinsky, that's where we'll you know, go first. And, and I try to weed out the uh, complicated things and let the orchestra, particularly these folks have played this piece many times and know it well, but not just know your part, know where you're important and where you're not. And mm -hmm. so weeding out the noise, because at certain points in the, in the, you know, infernal dance, it's just, you know, the percussion's going along and the violins are, they don't hear anything. It's just noise at that point, you know? So I think to weed all that out and see how things fit together, that's where we go first and try to get the most difficult things done and, and simplify. And, and uh, you know, I think doing it efficiently is, 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 is my secret, at least to whatever little success we have, is, is doing it efficiently. And also, you know, having great artistry requires trust. So, you know, me being able to make music with these great professionals, that's what I, I that's why I'm up there. You know, I'm sure I need to tell people what the tempo or the idea, we need one, otherwise we have 80 dissenting opinions. But for me, it's this collaborative process. You know, I'm, I'm a musician's conductor, so I, that's the real joy in trying to create this and have this trust barrier without saying anything. Where they're willing to go on this journey with me and together we can, because I need them. I need to empower them and impassion them 100%, you mm -hmm. know. And that's the real, uh, What's the word? That's the real magic that happens in these great performances that you can't put your finger on subconsciously. I think that's what we're looking for. So it sounds like it's going to be a great evening it for will us. Be. So after after this weekend is over, do you get to go on home and relax for a little bit? For a week, I'm back to okay. Los Angeles, uh -huh. and then on to some more concerts in Florida and Kentucky. After that, and, and it, is LA home for you now? It is. It is. Oh, yeah, okay. it's been uh -huh. home for since I went to school and never left. Yeah. Mm. But it's so nice, Chris, to come here and see the foliage and breathe fresh air, I have to say. <laughs> mm. Really rejuvenating and perfect for this week's concerts. Well, we are so much looking forward to this. We Thank are you. so glad you're here with us. This looks to be a terrific concert, and I'll be very excited to hear it, and that a lot of other folks will be too. Can't wait to produce it for you. All right. Thank you so much. Thank Great you. to talk with you. Thanks, Chris. Thank you.